All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, uh, Stani from Aave. And, and basically, today I'm going to do a, a presentation about uh, Lean DeFi and, and basically uh, how organic growth uh, can be compiled and also kind of like uh, delving into uh, basically the, the uh, DeFi today and, and how the value in DeFi is accumulating and also in the topic of, uh, of the uh, so-called yield farming. So, so basically the, the idea today is, is kind of like look at the, the, the story of Aave and, and what we're doing and, and uh, how we have accumulated growth since, since our launch uh, during Jan January to this point and also kind of like uh, how we're going forward uh, in this kind of like an ecosystem where liquidity rewards are playing a uh, very significant role and also uh, changing the dynamics uh, within the uh, space. And part of that we will see kind of like, are these liquidity incentives that we have today, are they actually uh, what are needed and sustainable? And if not, what could be a alternative way to have sustainable incentives. Uh, to start with quickly, I want to introduce a bit of uh, Aave and, and what we're doing. So uh, in essence, uh, we started a few years ago. Uh, our very first product was uh, EatLand, which was basically decentralized lending protocol uh, on Ethereum. And that was the very first one. And since last year, we have been building a more uh, liquidity pool uh, centric uh, lending protocol uh, and that was basically launched on January this year that's the other protocol and the idea of other protocol is that uh, we well you as a uh, user or depositor can basically deposit uh, different kinds of assets into a uh, global reserve uh, which is held on smart contracts and and you're earning interest on those uh, assets and then that liquidity can be consumed by borrowers, uh, borrowing against their collateral. So when you are depositing, you're getting a credit line and you can basically borrow against that. And one of the kind of interesting things that we have in, in the other protocol is that we are also not just thinking about uh, how to lock value inside of a protocol, but also how you could reutilize that value. And we have done that basically with the use of uh, flash loans. So in essence, uh, as Aave is a protocol, it, it doesn't mean that we have only one money market, but the, the idea is that uh, there is multiple money markets. So there's different kinds of uh, collaterals and assets that can be deposited with their own risk preferences. And the idea in the future is that anyone could actually create their own money market with different kinds of assets. So if there will be in the future, for example, tokenization of real assets such as real estate, there could be a money market where those uh, real estate assets could be used as a collateral and borrowed against. And typically, uh, the depositors are uh, depositing uh, stable coins such as uh, DAI, USDC, or USDT, and getting in return A tokens, which are interest interest bearing tokens, and uh, essentially giving a global uh, savings account uh, for for the uh, users. So um, we launched this year, January, and like one of the metrics to measure growth uh, in the uh, decentralized finance space is pretty much the total locked value. So uh, kind of like DeFi space is a pretty new thing. For many, it might not be. I mean, some of the instruments that we have in the space are pretty much uh, reflecting the traditional finance. For example, uh, what we are doing with the lending and borrowing, it represents kind of like a money markets and, and liquidity pools are, for example, the Uniswap style or balance style Uniswap pools are basically market making liquidity. But uh, as this space is kind of new for us, the developers and, and makers, what's interesting is that we always create terminology and narrative and, and, and one of the narratives is basically how much value you can lock into a smart contract. And basically, Aave started with pretty much zero. So every protocol starts from zero and, and kind of like uh, our story and growth story basically began 
in January when we launched, but there was a lot of uh, kind of like brand exposure and getting uh, your community to know what basically you're building and building this expectation. And that's kind of like the part of this uh, organic growth that uh, kind of like many do forget uh, as well. So it's not just basically that you launch in one day and the next day you actually have a lot of growth. It actually has a narrative behind it. And we have uh, built that narrative for a few years. So what's interesting here is that uh, we, since, since six months of launch, we have uh, roughly 120 million locked value in the smart contracts, which is pretty interesting and kind of like in line with the growth of the DeFi in the, in the current state. And there is like different reasons, like how we have grown and also kind of like how we have to grow in the future. Uh, we, we're going to go through. Um, in terms of like the the other metric that you can measure growth is basically the market size of your product. So what's interesting is that in the uh, DeFi, this is a graph from DeFi Pulse, and there's different kinds of uh, protocols and instruments. For example, you have lending, trading, and derivatives, and they're all measured with the same metric. But I think like more accurate metric for us is how what is the market size and how big it is. And currently we have a market size of 145 uh, million uh, USD award, which means that it's the locked value that you have in the smart contract. So how much people are trusting, but also the borrow volume. So it's a combination of supply and borrow volume. And most of the, the assets that we have are uh, that, that basically yield highest interest is, is basically uh, uh, stable coins. So it's 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 pretty common that you you're depositing certain different assets and basically you are borrowing another one. And one of the interesting things how we achieved a lot of growth is that we're trying to be very agile in terms of like what assets we are listing. So we're trying to look different kinds of communities and how those communities have uh, grown. Uh, their own community and, and build their own narrative. And that basically gives us, uh, uh, based on our risk parameters as well, uh, but the narrative itself gives us kind of like ability to list very interesting assets that have communities backing them up. One of the examples is, for example, the Link community or, or our own very own community that is uh, holding the Lend token. And being able to deposit those assets and borrow stable coins against them uh, brings a lot of value. And that's that's one of the use cases there. So kind of like what we are trying to do is that we are trying to be very um, agile in terms of list, listing and, and basically looking at how these different assets uh, fit our risk framework. And one of the interesting part of our risk framework is that even if the assets is not in the same comparison, for example, that is more mature, uh, we can always tweak those risk parameters that basically the, uh, uh, such as, for example, loan to value ratio, or for example, the liquidation uh, discounts that actually they are more secure to be kept in the protocol. So that's like very important part, like how and what helped us to grow until uh, this stage. And of course, one of the uh, coolest thing is that we basically try to, uh, besides listing assets into the main market, we try to create uh, new markets and opportunities. So one of the things is that uh, these different assets, they have their own risk parameters. And basically what we can do is that we, we can create completely new money market with their own assets, uh, basically, uh, with their own profiles. So let's say uh, if we know that uh, you can provide liquidity into uh, Uniswap or Balancer and you get in, you get in return uh, those uh, liquidity providing shares, you, those shares has value, but on the same time, and that value could be used for example as a collateral, but at the same time it poses a bit of additional derivatives and systematic risk because uh, basically if you provide uh, ETH and, and USDC in, in 50-50 form into Uniswap or Balancer, what's interesting is that uh, the value is the underlying tokens that you provide, but there's also additional uh, smart contract uh, risk because you need to trust Uniswap or Balancer as well. 
So basically what we have done is that we uh, are creating new money markets where we take into consideration these uh, derivative tokens and we allow users to use them as a collateral. And what that helps us to do is we can grow our locked value, our market size. And technically what's interesting here is that we are actually using the very same infrastructure, uh, the smart contract infrastructure on the main market and replicating it into uh, a, a new market. And we only need to basically create new price provider, price fee providers that we are auditing uh, with our auditors and, and that way we can fairly quickly create new markets and opportunities and that grows the TVL and user base. And if you imagine a world where uh, there will be more and more tokenized assets and especially real estate assets, you kind of want to have this separation of market because uh, then you can separate a bit of the uh, systemic risk and custody risk in different markets and still scale. So that's very important part of our strategy. And I think that will uh, be something that uh, we will see uh, quite extensively growing in the next uh, year or so. And of course, in terms of like what's coming up, uh, we are creating new money markets. Uh, there's going to be multiple new ones uh, that I can say at this point. Uh, the one that we are already announced that we are uh, launching pretty soon is the set uh, token sets market. That basically means that uh, you can, if you if you hold your portfolio in different kinds of uh, token sets, uh, that means that you lock their value and you, you you basically aren't using it any other way than actually locking it there and being long on those assets. And what we are doing at Aave, we basically allow you to uh, use those token sets, those locked value as a collateral or even lend them out at Aave. So basically, it creates a lot of new uh, DeFi opportunities in, in terms of uh, compatibility as well. And that also kind of like brings the value back into the uh, Aave protocol. And that's like pretty interesting stuff. And of course, like token sets markets, what we're uh, pretty much launching quite soon, but there's another well, other money markets that we are working uh, in parallel that basically allows you to uh, use different kinds of uh, uh, tokens as a collateral in, in Aave. So that's a pretty interesting way. And we will see like what's interesting here that uh, it's kind of like piling up the total of value because if you are supplying into Uniswap, you're providing value there, uh, locking value there. And if you're using those uh, liquidity shares in Aave, you're locking uh, value in Aave and you might borrow against from Aave and use it somewhere else. For example, uh, you might basically farm in Balancer uh, and that's kind of like the neat idea of, of this kind of like uh, uh, compatibility uh, in, in, in DeFi. And whether it's kind of like good or bad, it really is a question of risk management and the multiple strategy allows us to basically mitigate and create different kinds of risk and reward profiles, which is very interesting, uh, especially if you look at the look at the approach from the uh, institutional side. Uh, speaking of comp compatibility, uh, another key organic growth factor for us has been definitely the amount of integrations uh, we had uh, since this date. So. Uh, our protocol, since we launched, there has been dozens, dozens and dozens of different kinds of uh, things uh, built on top of Aave or integrated. For example, uh, you could uh, deposit your funds through my Ether wallet directly into Aave and borrow and open a credit line and borrow um, stable coins, for example, as well, or borrow some other assets. And also you can do the same, very same to Argent uh, as well. And, and currently, actually, we're uh, we're paying for the gas cost of, of the Argent users who are depositing uh, into Aave. So that's uh, pretty cool stuff if you want to try uh, very easy, accessible DeFi uh, and Aave exper experience. So all, all of the, 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 the things that has been built, some of them are in, in hackathons, some of them are uh, just integrations, but this is all a uh, very organic way to uh, bring more value into the ecosystem. And we see Aave as Aave protocol as kind of like an infrastructure product. We have a user interface and we're very proud of it. And, and we have uh, put a lot of effort in that. But 
we also know that like our very uh, major work is actually the underlying system, which is this smart contract system that holds uh, the liquidity and we're focusing on that. So we're trying to kind of like create an ecosystem where uh, liquidity can be plugged in or plugged out uh, with our smart contracts. And that's why they, these partners that we have and, and the project has, that has been built on top of Aave, these are very valuable for us. And these are, this is maybe one of the key reasons we have grown a lot. So we always kind of say that uh, everyone is part of the, the Aave fam. Uh, and of course, we've seen a lot of more institutional side uh, basically interested in, in the uh, protocol. And we see, for example, that uh, usually if you are using uh, more secured methods to store funds, such as, for example, Gnosis Safe, uh, what happens is that um, uh, you're putting a lot of effort in the security and, and basically you might be more from the institutional side. And we have seen a lot of growth in the uh, storage of A tokens in the Gnosis safe. And A tokens is the token that basically, tokens that, interest bearing tokens that you get when you deposit funds into the protocol. So this chart very much replicates like the growth uh, we had and, and we're pretty uh, amazed by uh, this, uh, the, this, uh, this chart. And actually, if you think about like A tokens in, in general, they kind of like, uh, automated treasure management for you because uh, you could pretty much buy a tokens, a USDC or a DAI from the market or deposit uh, the underlying token to Aave and, and get the a tokens. And that those a tokens are increasing in value straight in your address, which is the kind of like a cool part because of the one-on-one ratio. That basically means that uh, you have already automated uh, treasury management uh, that fights against the USD inflation. Uh, so that's that's a very neat way to, to handle your uh, treasury, especially if you are uh, institution or even if you're not, then you don't have time to, to manage that. It really reduces, for example, your uh, costs such as gas costs. So yeah, like one of the things when you're looking at organic growth and, and what you want to achieve, like you really need to think about the users and that's what we're doing all the time. So we have different kinds of user profiles uh, in, in Aave and we're always trying to benchmark a bit like why people are using us, especially when we are in a field where liquidity is very competitive and especially like you get a lot of rewards for liquidity and, and, and it saturates a bit the dynamics why people are depositing in different uh, different protocols. In this kind of space, it's very important that you have very diverse set of uh, reasons to use you. And of course, like the, the main reasons that people are using Aave is that they, they want just to earn or might be that the, the carring systems that they're using uh, aren't efficient for them. For example, they're using DeFi for that reason, or they want to access 24, uh, kind of like uh, they want to have 24 access to industry leading yields so for some people for example they they want to get yields not not maybe uh in form of uh liquidity rewards but actual yields but it, it really depends and of course uh the the direct access to money markets and and taking liquidity out out of there for example you might be earning on the earning side but you might want to sometimes exercise your credit. So some of your users might not just do one side of the, the market, but might be a user who are doing both of the sides. And this is like very key component that actually it's, it's possible to do so that you can use some assets as a collateral and, and then borrow against. And that is where we are trying to be very agnostic that, that basically whatever supply side there is on most of the assets you can actually use as a collateral as well. And of course, like the uh, one of the key users are the the uh, integrators and people who build on top of Aave. So that's something that you need to always mind that they're also users, and we're uh, trying to to basically have a relationship where we are servicing uh, everyone who integrates us or supplies liquidity or consumes liquidity. And yeah, and our memes, of, of course, are great. So it's, it's about also creating 
uh, culture. So everyone has some sort of reason to use Aave, and like that's something that we are benchmarking all the time and trying to keep things competitive. And being competitive doesn't mean only that basically you're trying to get the highest yield. And that is not even the, the purpose of Aave either. We're trying to list a lot of different kinds of assets, creating new markets and providing uh, uh, like higher, a slightly higher risk or slightly lower risk and, and tweaking the yields in different markets. But the ultimate goal is to create usability. And that's not, like the most important thing. And I think end of the day, uh, people care about yields, but they are not, they don't care too much to optimize uh, the yields because the more you optimize, the more you lose the optimization when everyone else is doing that as well. So I think that is why like one of the key things for Aave has been in, in the last six months is that we are trying to find those di diverse reasons why people are using us and serve them better. And that's very uh, important. Yeah, and part of the network effects in DeFi, uh, definitely uh, it's not just about liquidity. Liquidity is very strong, and that is something that we're going to discuss in a moment. But it's also about, uh, like, there's this uh, effect of people compatibility. So one of the interesting parts was that I was brainstorming with uh, Mariano Conte from Maker about um, using flash loans because you could not uh, open a new vault without closing another one. So that means that you need to return DAI. And we came up into the conclusion that actually you could use uh, of a flash loan, uh, borrow DAI and close the CDP, uh, sell, for example, the, the BAT collateral or WBTC collateral and open a ETH uh, vault again and return the loan. So you can actually change your loan position. And this is something that didn't exist as a tool or as a product in the market. And I asked, that, could someone build this thing? And uh, David Wrong, uh, one of the, uh, well, I didn't know the person back in then, uh, but he basically found the uh, discussion and he said that he will try to build this product. And he actually uh, created it where you can swap your collateral from E to bot and uh, vice versa. And then basically there was another user uh, who came, uh, Fiona, and, and basically she, she's not a basically developer in this case, but uh, actually used the product that David built on top of Aave and actually that uses even uh, Maker. And what's interesting is that uh, when that transaction happens in Maker, it generates fees into the Aave protocol because of the flash loans. And that's like interesting uh, way to extract uh, yields from, from the uh, DeFi space with the compatibility into your protocol. And that's what we're doing in Aave. So this thing happened and this shows like very interesting like human compatibility effect uh, as a network effect. And that's something that we're undermining, under undermining uh, very much, especially like today. And I think this is a very important to keep always uh, a strong aspect of, 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 of that's, that's how, how we see it. And yeah, and the flash loans itself, like you could see like it's just a feature in our protocol, but it's the consumption side is, is pretty good, especially after the Black Thursday. So what it means that you could actually borrow without any uh, collateral and what happens for one Ethereum transaction. So what happens is that you can do different kinds of compatibility uh, things without actually having any, uh, any uh, capital uh, up front. And one of the examples is DeFi Saver. So when you're closing your CDP, a Aave flash loan is used. And some of the flash loans are pretty big. There are hundreds of thousands of uh, DAI, for example, and you can pre-leverage your flash loan, as, uh, your, your wallet as well with DeFi Saver. So it just shows kind of like the, how important the compatibility and all of these relationships has been formed uh, kind of like with friendships as well. So the human compatibility is very, has been very, important uh, for us. And yeah, so now we're basically moving to the interesting or the kind of like the most recent part of the uh, DeFi ecosystem, which I call kind of like the agri-DeFi, uh, agri where basically the dynamics of the incentives are changing, especially in terms of like yielding or, uh, sorry, like uh, lending or the, the um, automated market making uh, protocols. And what we are having here is that we, we see models where tokens or so-called like equity, for the lack of a better uh, word, 
is used to basically change the dynamics and incentivize uh, liquidity providers uh, to bring more locked value and to bring more usage. And that has basically formed a kind of like a new hobby in the space where as liquidity is seen as the network effect, basically uh, the liquidity providers are jumping into the uh, DeFi field or, or they already are, are, but they're getting more exposure and, and basically farming those tokens uh, by providing liquidity. Now, it has been very interesting because like, there's a couple of things related to here is that uh, the, the farming has been quite uh, extensive and very short term. So like when liquidity providers are coming and, and farming, especially with large amounts, and we're talking about whales, what basically has happened is that uh, many liquidity providers who started out uh, basically notice that actually they're not earning that much of this so-called equity, equity or tokens. And because of the uh, reason that uh, more bigger liquidity providers are basically receiving most of the uh, rewards. So it's, it's just, it's, it's not an issue in terms of like uh, the rewards itself, but uh, it's just a kind of like design thing. So we need to understand always that uh, the liquidity mining or farming is not a bad thing, uh, but the challenge is that uh, basically uh, the it's it's very experimental and it takes a lot of time to design uh, a good pattern. And I think what's interesting about liquidity farming is that it does attract liquidity. We have seen, uh, for example, compound growing from uh, 100 million uh, TVL to all, all the way to 600 million. And it, re it basically incentivizes liquidity providers to try things that they otherwise wouldn't try. And maybe some of that liquidity will stay there parked. And it also allows you to incentivize different kinds of assets that you would normally have uh, low liquidity or not maybe that much usage at all. And yeah, and the TVL is, is pretty important in terms of exposure. I, I think people look at things like DeFi Pulse and, and rank different kinds of protocols based on just seeing those numbers there. But there's also kind of issues. Uh, it attracts so-called like, uh, like uh, fast liquidity for fast profits. So basically liquidity providers that are coming in and just selling whatever they're earning because as an LP, um, that's part of your reward. And what you, if you are not going to be in a long position and you don't have any reason to be, if there is no utility in the token or or, or basically you, your vote doesn't have much weight in the system and 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 if, if, if the supply is more controlled, uh, there's less reasons for you to keep uh, holding that particular token, especially in high market valuations. And for example, uh, the top 10 farmers are usually farming roughly 70% of all the so-called crops. And, and, and basically that's basically what I have uh, uh, seen in, in just looking at the scan on, on the uh, yields. And yeah, and then you might have kind of like incorrect experimental designs of the, the uh, liquidity mining where you basically incentivize, uh, your incentives are not that efficient or are going in the wrong direction. And for example, some of examples is where you are supplying liquidity and borrowing and without the reason to borrow any other reason that actually just farm the equity token. That doesn't bring any value uh, for the protocol in long term. And as it's seen kind of like helicopter money, money, it might not add the value for long term and that value could actually vanish. So the first thing is to always understand like what are you trying to incentivize? Why are you doing this thing? And we have been asking ourselves like, uh, if we would incentivize, how we will do it, and and why we will do it. So what what we are trying to achieve uh, uh, as a as a protocol, as a com community, more or less. And I, I think like the system sustainability is the 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 key aspect. So uh, if you pay a token to incentivize incentivize the liquidity issues or or increase liquidity, like will it solve anything? And also like what are you trying to achieve? Like are you trying to uh, achieve to get more short-term or long-term liquidity? And this is an important question because as time passes and the longer the liquidity stays in the system, uh, it basically means that your liquidity 
uh, acquisition costs are going lower if you are able to uh, get people to park liquidity and, and being the early adopters in the protocol for taking that risk. So actually, like instead of rewarding uh, uh, liquidity providers to for coming and grabbing and 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 kind of like r removing the richness of the soil, you actually need to find out how there are uh, basically they can contribute more into the soil and and that the whole protocol benefits and that's something that we're working on Aave. And of course, the early risk takers rewarding that's that's the kind of like part of the uh whole thing yeah so it's kind of like how would you find a organic fertilizer that actually works for your community there's nothing wrong with liquidity mining but it's very difficult to craft a, a system that it benefits your community and you need to always think your community and ask how how those incentives feel like and find the kind of like a right path uh, another important thing is that we always tend to focus on the, the rewarding liquidity providers, but we always we, we don't think that much on how we are securing the systems unless there is an event like Black Thursday or some kind of smart contract hack. So in this case, what's important is that uh, you, what we have seen in our research is that actually you could uh, not just reward liquidity providers, but you can... Uh, uh, incentivize the uh, stakeholders of your protocol to stake value into the protocol and, and basically secure uh, and ensure those liquidity providers liquidity in case there is some sort of like a, a deficit event. And that way you, you basically uh, are providing more utility for, for your uh, native asset, for example, that, that the liquidity providers are uh, creating. And this is like very interesting way that that you could actually combine something that Maker has and something that the, the recently we have seen. So staking is important because uh, the, as, as the TVL is getting high, it attracts more, uh, more uh, liquidity. The stakes are also high. And if something goes wrong, there's a risk that the whole DeFi will lose its face. And in that case, it's very difficult to recapitalize after that. And yeah, once we scale DeFi, we need more hedging and insurance. And, and that is why having a staking mechanism and, and way to secure the protocol is, is uh, even more important than the liquidity incentives. And that creates the utility for the tokenomics besides the fact that you are able to vote and govern the protocol. And so basically the takeaway of this talk was that uh, uh, li liquidity provider uh, incentivizing liquidity providers in essence is not a bad thing uh, but I think there's a lot of work to do for everyone to, to basically make it more sustainable and I'm really eager to see like how the DeFi space will con continue with this uh, experimentation uh, yeah so if you have any questions or to ask you can always uh, uh, ask in the chat box and I will basically answer whatever uh, you have in mind. Uh, this is the Ava team uh, in total, and we're known as the Avengers. And here is a, a, a QR code into our uh, Telegram if you have any questions or you want to follow us and ask more stuff there. And besides that, yeah, I, I think it's pretty much here. And thank you everyone for, for watching this. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask or re reach me out if you have any anything uh, you want to ask. Thank you.